Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome back to Watches Tonight and Watchbox Studios. Friends, thanks for joining me from around the world. Tonight, we talk hated watches, the importance of boxes and papers when buying watches, bad watch listings, the unheralded watchmakers of Montrejon, debt and watches, the most interesting movement in production today, and watches that have not aged well. Welcome to my friends around the world, Eddie Landsberg, Russell 9 and 6, Gregory W. You are the first in the box. I want to remind you before we move into the program that there is no better place to buy, trade, and sell luxury watches than thewatchbox.com. Paying for these pixels and the those, they employ me, they make my money. But remember, it's also the best place to buy, trade, and sell because they are the place where I buy my own watches. Not just an employee, a customer. And check the link in the box below. If you're watching this recorded, there is a link where you can win our Seiko Astron GPS Solar, a $1,600 value. It's our October giveaway, which means the time is ticking away. You won't have too many more opportunities. Okay, time to run. This is batting practice where I warm up with your pitches and my cuts, where we call BS on the worst listings around the web. Worst watch sales listings. Our audience regular Trevor S. has called my attention to a Chrono 24 listing that is crying out for attention. To be entirely fair, this seller admits that the watch is a low-rent knockoff with no pedigree, but the use of a brand name as clickbait rubs me the wrong way, so they're making the list. And I'm sure Audemars Arpigay loves being rolled into the 7-Eleven sausage casing of a listing. Despite the AP moniker, I'm also certain that if Daniel Roth is watching tonight, this monster just ruined his evening. That's Daniel Roth, and this is what just ruined his night. Unfortunate, but that's the resemblance. And this thing goes with an AP label, or at least an AP listing label. I also take exception in this listing for a watch that's being sold for real money, three grand, of Bigfoot grade image quality. In a watch that costs thousands of dollars, we need to do better than that. And display case back, oh yes, baby got back. Baby got back, but unfortunately like a baboon. I gotta love those chemically dyed blued screws. Again, this is billed as an Audemars Piguet in the listing title. I'm sorry if they've wasted your time. They certainly wasted mine. All things considered, no human watch collector could pay $3,000 for this thing, but there's an owner profile for every watch, and I believe I know the ideal customer for this one. It's a perfect match. All right, but there's no need to seek knockoffs for your daily dose of bad Audemars Piguet. In fact, you shouldn't settle for less than the real deal in search of bad listings and big laughs. I saw this Chrono 24 Royal Oak 14790 midsize military dial, and I thought we were off to the races thanks to an indifferent recasing and a bolt askew. You could see, if we uh, look down to the quarter of that one at 10 o'clock, that those are all supposed to align in a ring around the dial. Not the case. But gold always beats steel, and if anything, this guy can do badder. The gold standard in the worst possible way, it's easier to just show the bolts that he correctly aligned. So these are the bolts that he placed aligned in the correct fashion. If we could go to the three survivors, and this timepiece unfortunately being sold, here's the best part. It's being sold under the aegis of superb condition. Welcome to the world of grading watches on a curve. Uh, superb, superb condition, no papers, unfortunately. I can't imagine what a failing grade looks like to this particular professor. Help name and shame improve the e-commerce ecosystem via survival of the fittest. Send your time to run bed watch listings to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Eddie Landsberg asking, how is Daniel Roth? Last I heard, he's still practicing on an individual basis and doing well. I could see we've got Steve Bowden, we've got Pastor, we've got Juan, Mitchell, Pilot Style, Big Mike, Ross, David L, Chris Hood. Thank you so much, guys. And Chris is saying, love how AP even aligns the screws. AP does. That listing doesn't. Jumping into the questions. Ferdy X asks, Tim, are there any watches you hate? Uh, yes. Counterfeit and Franken watches. The integrity violations that detract from the fun of the hobby and undermine the image of the watch collector fraternity. Otherwise, I would never slate something legitimate, no matter how weird, offbeat, oversized, or ugly, because there's no point in insulting something that even one person might enjoy. There are too many watches to love to find the time to hate them. Life's too short to hate watches, guys. Okay, Bobby T asking, do you really believe a person should never borrow money to buy a watch? Why? Oh, 
Worst story I ever heard, real story, in the Washington Post, no less. If I did this sort of thing, I would never admit it. Adam Kreniotis, who founded Red Bar, borrowed money from his mom to buy an IWC Big Pilot Perpetual Calendar. I'm sure he's a fun guy and he's a cool dude, but if I borrowed money from my mom to buy a watch, that would never hit the light of day. And by the way, bad idea. In terms of debt for a watch, this should be pure pleasure. If you have even a small inkling of anxiety about paying off your watch, it's not a pure pleasure. Never finance fun. If you want to dump the whole thing on a high limit credit card, so you can get the miles or the points and then pay the balance immediately. Okay, I'm all for that, but that's not really taking on debt. That's more like engineering your next intercontinental flight. Steve, uh, Sean K asks, Tim, what happened to the white gold Rolex Skydweller? I've been saving for this watch with a view to buying it in order to mark a promotion to partner within my firm. But I look on Rolex.com and it's not listed what gives. Hi, Sean. Okay, a little bit of bad news. The short answer is that the older case and dial of the full white gold sky dweller was discontinued after 2017. When Rolex launched the newer steel sky dweller for one third of the price, something had to change because while Rolex won't admit this, there was discontent among watch buyers of the ruinously expensive white gold and platinum Yacht Master II from 2007. That was originally the only way to get a white metal Yacht Master II, and some people who had the means bit the bullet and bought that thing for almost 50 grand. And then this 2012 steel model came, and this is where the bad blood started, because now you could get a white metal Yacht Master II for a fraction of the price, bearing almost the same appearance, and if anything, a few desirable blue accents that upgraded the look. Folks were pissed. So, in order to better cushion early white gold sky dweller adopters and create a measure of scarcity, Rolex discontinued the original 326939 sky dweller white gold when the steel model dropped. And that's the story of the white gold sky dweller. Good news, that watch can still be found in inventory new at authorized dealers. So you're not out of luck, you're just gonna have to call around. And pre-owned, probably the best way to buy a full gold Rolex complication. Jan N asks, Jan, we're gonna see a little bit of you on here because you also sent us a wrist chat, but first, moving on, Jan N asks, hi Tim, if you have a limited budget, would you rather do without box and papers or save a little more money to get a full set. I'm talking about regular models, not limited editions. What's your call? Okay, Jan, I've done this, so let me outline my thought process and how it has evolved over time as a collector. When I entered the hobby, I accepted the sacrifice, buying a watch in decent shape from a seller of repute without box and papers. And at the time, I focused on watches that defied counterfeitings. They were either too complicated to duplicate, or they were worth too little for the amount of energy that would go into counterfeiting them. And I bought my Master Ultra Thin 34, my JLC Master Ultra Thin 34, and my Amvox 2 Vertical Trigger Chronograph naked on this basis, and I was happy. I got the watch I wanted at the price I thought was okay. Later, I began to reconsider this position after buying my Reverso Tourbillon for less than 25% of the original 2003 list. I came to realize that if I'd paid maybe 30% of list, I could have gotten that watch with a full set, and it really began to burn me as I became more of a collector and less of just an aggregator. As my collection started to take shape as a blueprint, I started to feel bad about missing pieces of that picture. So here's what I know today and where I stand. Not all boxes and papers are created equal, and this is the first thing you need to understand, because as a retailer on the buying side, we regard a watch without papers as essentially naked. We don't really care if it has a box at that point, because you can buy boxes and accessories on eBay. And after the certificate of origin or warranty card in particular is gone, we care far less about the boxes and accessories. As a retailer, I have to say that the warranty origin document is the most important to us because it can never be reconstituted. A determined eyeball with patience and a credit card can put a boxed set back together on eBay. Especially with something like Patek, once the certificate of origin is gone, you're never getting it back. Patek will not reissue it. They will give you an extract from the archives, not a certificate of origin, and that's true across many brands. I'll also say that we pay less and charge less for no-doc watches as a result. Personally, I say boxes and papers 
both when buying common late model watches like a Rolex Hulk. This is important whether you're buying or selling because plenty are available despite the pre-owned markup and the new weight if you buy it in AD. Nevertheless, real inventory is out there and most full box and papers. So don't settle and don't leave yourself with a challenge when the time comes to sell it. Buy it intact and sell it intact. It's one less concern on your mind. When tons of identical examples of modern watches are available, boxes, papers, and condition become a big differentiator. So especially when you're talking about an interchangeable modern watch, you want to buy it as complete as possible so you can sell it as complete as possible, or simply have that psychic satisfaction, as I did not, of knowing your watch is truly a collector's piece and not just a hunk of metal in your watch box. Now, with watches whose origin documents are essential to their specific collector crowd, and this is Patek again. Patek Philippe and its certificate of origin falls into this category. These watches are considered almost bastards by many purists if they don't have that certificate of origin. As Patek says, it's your watch's birth certificate and it can't be reissued. So, there are certain circumstances when it's okay to buy a naked watch without having to explain yourself to the next buyer. And those cases often revolve around rarity and age. So, something like this market not numerous modern Rolexes is where you see the inflections. Consider a LeCoult deep sea diving alarm. This first came out in 1959. It's a watch that is in absolute beaten condition, beaten to death, worth $25,000. In mint, $50,000, $60,000. Here, condition is important. And if you feel that the seller is reputable, you're getting an original watch, unadulterated in original condition, don't worry about whether it has the original green box. No vintage watches have that. It's not an expectation. When you see it, it feels like a unicorn, but it's not expected. Or let's say you find a Rolex Submariner 5510 Explorer dial. How many of those ever existed? Of the 5510s, maybe 200 to 500 were Explorer dials. So if you find the real thing, and it's authentic, and you trust the seller, don't worry about the box. The box here is the case. It's the case that says 5510. This is a watch that's important, rare, desirable, and no one's gonna miss the cardboard. So, that's kind of the equation. The newer the watch, the more common the watch, the more important the box and the papers. So, Bert V, moving on, asks Tim, on a purely technical basis, what is the most interesting movement on the market today? Is it complicated? Is it simple? Does it come from a mainstream or boutique brand? Well, it comes from a bit of a boutique, but the company behind this brand is a billion dollar retailer. The retailer is Bucherer, number one in watches and jewelry on the continent of Europe. And when architecture, technical ambition, innovation, and actual functions are rolled together, give me the Carl F. Bucherer CFB A1000. It was previewed at Basel World 2008, shortly after Bucherer bought a company called THA, effectively an F.P. Journ and Vianney Halter founded movement specialist. So this launched the following year in 2009 within the Petravi sporting line and remains almost unique as a mass market peripheral rotor automatic. These have been called too expensive to make by the CEO of Carl F. Bucherer. Not unprofitable, but like break-even level, so you know they spared no expense, and I like that, especially when the prices pre-owned are favorable. Peripheral automatics were conceived in the 1950s, but we really didn't see one in series production until 1970 with the Patek Philippe Caliber 350, and then the 350i for improved. They spent almost all of a decade and a half until 1985 covering warranty claims and trying to make the thing work. So Patek could not summit this particular Everest. That said, it's almost a cautionary tale because the rest of the industry abandoned that cause until Carl F. Bucherer in 2008 with the A1000. So. What are the benefits of this system? It's weird, it's rare, it's tough to make, but what does it mean to you, the collector? Well, for one thing, peripheral automatics like you'll find on the Carl F. Bucher Petravi Evotech Daydate, which is a lovely, complete calendar, you will find that it's a thinner watch while still being automatic. 
it has a display case spec that is as open and visible as a pure manual wind. There's no rotor, there's no winding bridge to obscure that for which you have paid. And, as you can see with the day and the date, it becomes easier to add complications when you have a peripheral rotor system moving the automatic mechanism out of the way. Where else can you find peripheral rotor automatics today? You're going to have to go way up the financial pecking order. For instance, you'll find it on super watches like AP Extreme Complications. How about a Royal Oak Offshore self-winding chronograph tourbillon? Well, yeah, that's where you'll find this kind of automatic system, as well as on high complications from AP, Breguet, Chagere Le Coult, and Vacheron Constantin. So rarefied air, you can get one for 10 grand, used CFB A1000. Viewer wrist shots, your pieces on my pixels, Yen N, we've already mentioned him once, he's back, of Aberdeen, Scotland, sharing his Rolex Explorer by the shore. Next, Quan N puts us on the road again, thanks to his Rolex Datejust 2 and 2014 Porsche Panamera. I love your watch and wheel shot, guys. Phil rocks with an AP Royal Oak 15300 ST, the late great 15.3 in 39mm, nicely composed. I love the reflection in the colors. And Tom L's Rolex Explorer 2, 42 millimeter joins us from the USA's Yosemite National Park. Photo, a memento of summer months past. You guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see him here. By the way, speaking of summer months past, I've switched over to my winter garb. It's like military uniform changeover. You get the order from personnel headquarters, you go from your summers to your winters and back again. We're in the winters. Unless you're south of Jacksonville, you probably have joined me already. Now, Gerhard H. asking, Hi, Tim. I've heard that watchmakers work at FP Journe who are not FP Journe and that they do all of the actual assembly and finishing. When did FP Journe stop creating the watches himself? Isn't the company motto invent and facite or unvenite et facite? So invented and made. Yep, it's all over the dials. It's the company motto unvenite et facite. But here's the thing. He invents and makes the prototype. Let's back up and discuss his process. Back in 1999, with the original 20 subscription Tourbillon Remontoir, absolutely, he invented and then he physically made it on his bench. Since then, things have changed. So we need to be clear about the distinction between F.P. Journe, the man, and Montrejourn, the company under which he has been building watches in his name since 99. So here's the thing. Francois Paul is a practicing watchmaker who designs, engineers, and prototypes and troubleshoots all new models that bear his name and the motto on his dial. At his eponymous firm, he is still the sole creative talent and design visionary. But at no point since 2000 has F.P. Journe employed fewer than a dozen watchmakers engaged in the production of his timepieces. That's the only way you can make 600 to 900 pieces a year. The watchmakers who authentically make every single darn thing themselves are the likes of... Aaron Beche, who's going to make 6 to 12 watches a year. The true one-man bands don't have manufacturers. They don't have factories. They don't make hundreds of watches per year. That said, the number of watchmakers working under Mr. Jorn today is closer to about a dozen. But let's be honest, almost every name that is eponymous watch brand, of which the founder is still alive, does the same thing. Laurent Ferrier, De Witt, even Grubel Forcy do the same thing. Grubel makes 80 to 100 watches a year in Le Chaux de Fonds, and 100, piece, 100 actual people make those 100 pieces happen. It's not Grubel and Forcy at their bench making those outrageous movements. They're envisioning it, but they even have people helping them with the design and engineering these days. Mr. Jorn is still almost unique for a company making hundreds of watches, and I'd still say that FP has more personal input in the genesis of that 6 to 900 than Grubel and Forcey personally put into their 90-ish pieces a year. All right, now, let's see who's in the chat box, and I can see we've got all manner of friends. Uh, Joss9991 asking, will Watchbox Switzerland ship from Switzerland to other European countries? Yes. Jeff Zhu greeting us from uh, Sydney, Australia. Joseph greeting us from Philly. He must be just outside. He's a local. I can see Brick Lane is saying he loves our viewers 15300 and watch aficionado saying that the problem with bookers is that they are still thick despite the peripheral rotor. They're thick-ish. They're not quite there. They're not Royal Oak offshore thick. 
And of course, AWOL is asking, does the System 51 use a peripheral rotor? No. The System 51, and I own one, so I know, has a central rotor like a conventional automatic. Right here. We have a question. Is Philippe Dufour the last soul maker? No, not even close. Everyone from Zushu Ma to Hajime Aseoka to Aaron Beche to Molnar and Fabri are making the watches solo, or in the case of Molnar and Fabri, two up. There are many one-horse shops still going in the business. Tonight, our primary feature, watches that have not aged well. In any industry, we celebrate the people, the visions, products, and decisions that stand the test of time. The 1963 Corvette Stingray, the music of Django Reinhardt, and, of course, the 1953 Rolex Sub. It still looks like a 2018 Rolex Sub. And then there are the ones that age with neither grace nor plaudits. O.J. Simpson movie rolls. That's a big one. Neck tattoos. These do not age gracefully. High on the list of regrets, too. Computer graphics. Especially when they're computer graphics of 80s music videos. Great song, by the way. And 70s hair. Followed shortly there, by the way, 70s hair, not just about hair on the head. Chest hair, sideburns, beards, anything went back then, especially the mustache. Surpassed only by 80s hair. When hair officially became a cliché. I was born in 1984, the year of the rat. Round and round we go. Where we stop? Watches that have not stood the test of time, that's where. Yes, there are watches that have not stood that test. There are watches that fashion and taste forgot or wish they could forget. While some watches come back into fashion, the luxury timepieces on this list have yet to see their genius discovered. Rolex, Paddock, Zenith, IWC, they're all here, so we're hitting big brand names. Patek Philippe, first up, foremost name in watches, foremost on our list, and the 1990s were an important era for Patek Philippe and for Russia. In 1997, Patek returned to the Russian market for the first time since Romanovs were still a thing, and the Russian watch series, a nickname but an apt one, was the result. A family of variants based on the 5091 sculpture unofficially named the sculpture, but it was an apt description as the watch was sensuous, curvaceous, and complex in a way that, well, frankly, even folks of the time had trouble endorsing and embracing. Custom ordered by Patek's then Russian retailer, it was small at 36.5 millimeters, weirdly uh, sculpted, because it is the sculpture, and with a signature crown in gold and authentic enamel, that evoked imperial-era decorative eggs, cathedral towers, or possibly chamber pots. Even in steel, which tends to tone down weird watches, this one was a step beyond, and the sculpture 591A exuded eccentricity and new money exuberance that even 1990s Moscow couldn't quite stomach. So it's weird, it's small, many of them are two-tone and with yellow gold, not rose, and it's still out of fashion even in the land of V12 AMG Galenda Wagon daily drivers and preschool taxis. So where does that leave us? I think this one will still find resurrection. That military dial in steel looks cool. And everything that is so badly cliched that it elicits chuckles eventually becomes a sort of counterculture cool, almost subver subversive. So. 2,700 pieces in total, with 300 of each variant made, means this is a rare watch. If you get that military dial in steel, original tritium with only 300 made, you might have something. Not today, not tomorrow, and probably not next year, but I'm gambling for the resurrection of this one someday, perhaps when the Romanovs are reseated. Rolex. That's right, Rolex is on this list. While Rolex's first quartz watch, the Beta 215100, was something of a sleeper hit and today is highly collectible, the model that followed has never found love outside of its time frame, and that is the Oyster Quartz. So what does cost no object engineering? Designed, cued by Gerald Genta at the peak of his powers. Not designed by Genta, but cued by Genta's work back then. As well as vintage Rolex aura, extreme rarity, and original retail prices that scraped clouds. What does that buy us in this era? 
Unfortunately, not much. If we're talking about the Rolex Oyster Quartz, the answer is surprisingly little respect, even from hardcore watch cognoscente. Now that is objectively cool. I would make that along with the Z Blue my first Rolex ever. But over a quarter of a century, only about 25,000 Oyster Quartz date just and day dates were made. And that's from roughly 1977 to 2002. So we're talking a long time and very few watches from a company whose production never amounted to less than hundreds of thousands a unit a year during that period. I would also say this, the movements, if you're a movement guy, you need to consider Oyster Quartz. They were lifetime calibers designed to spare no expense. COSC certified quartz, that is still rare today. And thermocompensated, rare at any time, jeweled, watchmaker built, watchmaker adjusted, watchmaker serviced, with a Swiss lever locking escapement that stopped invariably every time on the index as the second ticked. It was a traditional Swiss lever, that's right. And it featured modular stepper motors so the motors could always be pulled out to service the caliber over time. They could even be rebuilt by microelectronics experts. The 5035 and the 5055 pair had it all except respect. So today, these trade at 3500 to about 13,500, just depending on whether you want a two-tone date just oyster quartz or you want to go whole hog on a white gold date date. These are buys right now. You will not find a more appealing scarcer and quirkier vintage Rolex option going. These will take off someday. That time is not yet, and that's to your advantage. Okay, IWC, two sweeties that deserve better. First, the 1985 IWC Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar Chronograph. This one had quite a supernova impact when it bowed, designed by the great Hanno Bircher and engineered by Kurt Klaus. The watch was a sensation when it bowed at Basel, 1985. A stupendous recommitment to traditional, complicated mechanical watchmaking by IWC. It was the talk of the fair. That said, it had a long run, and if anything, the world changed around it, because during its 24-year production run, watch buyer tastes certainly altered, even if the 39mm case and bubble sapphire and hinged lugs mostly stayed static. So let's see what it's got against it. 39 millimeters, it's small. It's got a bit of a bubble profile with that plexiglass crystal, and it is a plexiglass glass crystal. Not everyone can buy into that on a luxury watch. It's often in yellow gold and always hinged lugs. That's the thing, but it's a gem and a lovable bargain, especially in steel. You can pick up the steel models all day long, boxes and papers for $7,000 to $10,000, and you're getting an automatic perpetual calendar chronograph designed by Hanno Bircher, who's uh, sort of below the radar watch nerd love affair, kind of a fixation, a guy who designed some of the best IWCs of the 80s and 90s, and Kurt Klaus, who needs no introduction. So, it inspired the 2017 IWC Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar, and maybe that's the wrong kind of way to rehabilitate this one, because that watch also stumbled on release. So what do I say? I say buy them to love them, buy them for technical interest, gamble on resurrection long term, but for now, this one remains profoundly uncool. A wallflower, if ever there were one. Second, an orphan of IWC's 1990s golden era and renaissance, when folks especially John Mayer, apparently, speak of IWC in the 90s. They speak of the first Portuguese minute repeater. They talk about the GSTs. They talk about the arrival of the first Deep One. They talk about the return of a regular production Portuguese and the resurrection of IWC as an established house in mechanical watchmaking. What was a nerd interest in the 80s became mainstream in the 90s. And I have to say, the watch that I'm about to show you at face value seems to have it all. It's a direct descendant of the 1976 Gerald Genta Jumbo Ingenieur. It has a JLC movement, rarely COSC certified. If you want a COSC certified JLC in the modern era, it's IWC, it's Vacheron, and then it's nothing, because JLC didn't do that. And it's a signature family from the Ingenieur model line. What is wrong with it? Well, unfortunately, the Ingenieur 3521 is just too darn small. The 1990s IWC 3521 was just too tiny. 
34 millimeters in a men's watch today is considered unacceptable. It was considered standard back then. After all, if you were an ingenieur or a technician, you wanted a watch low in profile, discreet in size, something that would fly below the radar at CERN and not catch on technical equipment. So this was just what the doctor ordered back then. Guys, if you can find it in your heart to love a 34 millimeter watch, please. This one needs a good home. But watches that are too big date and watches that are too small, unfortunately, also age poorly. And that's the case with the 3521 chronometer ingenieur. Jumping into 2000s Zenith. This is the den of infamy. Now, we talk about this decade. It was really the 1920s and the 1980s all over again. The sheer lack of sobriety was its hallmark with economic hangover to match. Design oddities like the Star C Open, we can disregard that because that was a ladies model and not core collection. Although I get a little bit of a chill looking at that. But the male buyer targeted by Zenith Chieftain and former Vuv Clicquot Champagne pitchman Terry Natoff might not have been expecting what came next. Nope, the Dayfly Extreme was Terry's signature and a bit of a shock even by 2006 standards. It was his signature, his opus, and for better or worse, his legacy in the watch space. And because this was the 2000s, he spelled Extreme with an X. Because when you spell Extreme with an X, the kids know that you're dead serious about this kind of thing. It looked just as weird in the light of day. The press photos were strange, but even without the airbrushing, the watch looks bizarre. If anything, more so. It becomes almost surreal without the airbrushing. And remember the maxim that I used to have about the strength of a brand being inversely proportional to the number of planes and pilots in its advertising? Well, since we're on the topic of press photos, even the ads for this series have aged without grace. We can go full screen of that one, guys. And if you note, in the background, that feels very much like a Breitling ad of the same vintage. Almost too much. Dayfy Extreme Open. Whatever does not destroy me makes me stronger. And maybe that's a fitting epitaph for that era, because what followed immediately thereafter was the jean frederic Dufour resurrection of the brand between 2010 and 2015. Will these ever be rehabilitated? Well, let me think. I think it's possible. Just like 1970s hair and we've seen all too many hipsters with 70s hair these days. Okay, check that. Maybe that's more like 1870s hair, but the point stands. Old stuff comes back, even when it's profoundly bizarre. And I have to say that we're starting to speak sweetly of the long derided 1970s Zenith El Primero TV screen, which was considered a monstrous 40 millimeters back when it bowed in 1974. If we can rehabilitate that once denigrated monster, if it's now considered cool, hip, and with it, even the vision of Mr. Natoff may yet be vindicated. The watches are forever. They feel great in the hand. They're built like vaults. And we know that is not dead, which can eternal lie. And in strange eons, even watch snob stigmas may die. Jump into our viewer wrist shots. Dan V shares the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathys Scaff Chrono, maybe the most underrated chronograph on the market. He bought that one at Goffberg. Thank you for trusting our company. Steve B shares his JLC Master Compressor Chronograph that he bought from Watchbox via John Callahan. Thank you so much for trusting the other side of our company. And Paul V, also a Watchbox client of Josh Thanos, our Friday regular, rocks his JLC Reverso Tribute Calendar and his Land Rover. Dual way watch, two sides, and Land Rover, on road, off road, a fitting theme. Andrew A captures his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra and a different type of watch and wheels that is a genuine Lance Tour de France Discovery Channel trek in the background. I still think Lance is cool. If Jacques Anquetil is still considered the winner of the Tour de France in my heart, so is Lance Armstrong. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Stay online with me when the broadcast ends at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I plan to update tonight. Will you be there? Guys, remember, in the description below, click the link to win our Seiko Astron GPS Solar. A $1,600 value. I'm giving that one away in the next two weeks. Thank you for all who joined me this evening. I appreciate your time. If you got up late, if you stayed up early, doubly so. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. I'm Tim. This is Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Time out, Tim out.